said we would start at 7.30, got a nice group here, and I'm sure there are some, a group of very interested people around the world who are uh, tuning in. Uh, Shiva Parasad, uh, who is the president of the Theosophical Order of Service in India, said he would uh, be with us tonight. And uh, so we want to be sure to say hello to him and others. Uh, from England who are uh, no. with us also. Um, are we ready? I guess we're ready to start now. Is that right? Yeah. Is it starting? So what we wanted to talk to about tonight, uh, because it has relevancy uh, in the world and what's happening in the world, uh, we said we would give vignettes on atavism and uh, uh, new forms of mental illness that are evolving in the world in the late 20th and 21st centuries. So with atavism, we say that atavism is a, uh, a product of the uh, past lives in, in, that have been very influential and have affected our uh, present incarnation. Um, one of the things that probably nobody on the planet is talking about is psychological disorders that evolved out of World War II. People that were put in concentration camps uh, were uh, obviously traumatized, uh, millions of people, and they reincarnate into the world, and many of them bring with them uh, the disturbances uh, through the permanent atom, the, what we call the reincarnating permanent atom. I have a sister uh, who has suffered all of her life from as far back as I can remember. Uh, when I was maybe four, and she was, I think, seven or eight very disturbed, uh, didn't want to go to school, uh, just through fits, absolute terror fits. Every morning, my mother had to deal with that to get her dressed and get her to school. As I began to explore the esoteric and be, became familiar with atavism, uh, it took a lot of years a lot of meditation, and it took uh, the opening of head centers uh, for me to see the reality of her situation, uh, where she herself was one of these victims of a concentration camp and was horribly traumatized. And it caused all kinds of psychological disorders. The most recent last week was she had a tremendous fear of being tattooed. And if you know anything about the Jews and the concentration camps, we used to, I had a condo down in just northern Miami and I'd go to the grocery store and there'd be elderly men and women who were tattooed, they had their number tattooed, you'd see them to some up here, some, some on the years. And she was just absolutely beside herself. She's living in the nursing home and that they were going to come in and tattoo her, which is, I believe, a direct product of this previous incarnation. But there are many, many other things too. And atavism, is we see it in, uh, uh, if, we, if we're observant, we see it. I had a guy, I think I told this story to you one time. Um, I had a, a young guy, I think he was 28 or 29. It was a treacherous guy. He uh, worked at General Motors <clears throat> Design Center. And uh, I said one day, just in passing, I said, boy, this guy, you know, he's like a Nazi or something. He's like a reincarnated <laughs> Nazi. I've never 
I've never seen a guy that young that was that diabolical. So uh, as fate would have it, as fate would have it, um, he, uh, they had a, uh, I had a guy, another guy who worked for me. Uh, he was, uh, he liked to do reenact. And you see these guys are Civil War reenactors, Revolutionary War, World War II reenactment people. And they were going to do a reenactment of the Normandy landing. They had the boats and things over on Lake St. Clair. And this young man that was one of the reenactors for the good guys, the Allies, said, you'll never guess what happened at the reenactment and who I ran into <laughs> over on St. Clair's Shores. I said, no, I said, no. Oh. He said, I, I can't I should say the guy's name. because, But anyway, he said, well, he was there and he named this guy. And I said, you got to be kidding, no? He was dressed up as a Nazi and he was in a machine gun nest shooting at us as we were coming ashore. And I said, it's, I, I was absolutely right. And of course, the guy didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> I said, my, my intuition was right. And, uh, and there you go. Here's this guy. He wanted to be a Nazi and, and be in the reenactment of the Normandy invasion that hundreds, hundreds of people took part in this. Hey, it wasn't six guys. <clears throat> storming the beach. I mean, it was a huge, and there's unbeknownst to me, apparently there's a very large group of these World War II reenactors. Hmm. We used to go to the airports. You, you all would know this. Remember back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, and the Hare Krishna kids would be there and they would just be going nuts and, and giving their books out and they were in a, almost a state of hysteria, some of them, which we will also talk about tonight. You'll have to help me with the time as we get close to about 10 after eight because we want to allow time for questions and answers. So I've got to get with the program myself. I'll have to speed it up a little bit. But anyway, here were these people who were obviously, we used to talk about it in England, Clairgate, who were. Uh, reincarnated probably had a series of lives in India and were practicing the religion there. And now all of a sudden, they were fortunate enough to be born in America. Uh, and uh, they're acting out really what was uh, maybe a series of past lives uh, in, uh, in India and of a certain religion. But uh, you see that it's pretty common, really, if you're observant. And so we, we don't, there's tremendous uh, uh, disadvantage for many people in the field of psychology and psychiatric medicine who have no understanding of atavism and who don't understand reincarnation and who don't believe in karma and those sort of things. Uh, I, I really feel kind of sorry for them. A lot of them are people who are interested in that particular work, uh, were the people who were involved in it in Atlantis. And we'll talk about Atlantis uh, a little bit here in the future, uh, part of this, this lecture. <clears throat> and some things that are happening today that have reappeared and may be atavistic uh, with the, the world of politics uh, as it is in the world. But anyway, so yeah, atavism should always be a consideration. If you're doing counseling with people, you're counseling people, a lot of times they'll say certain things, see, and they'll hit like a, a bell, it'll ring a bell or in your mind, or it'll make a sound that you'll feel en rapport with. 
and it gives you a clue. The masters oftentimes teach that way. They'll give you a clue. We were just talking about it the other night. The other day it was Rhonda. Rhonda and I were talking about uh, the Nephilim, what they're now calling the Nephilim. And of course they were the giants and the remnants of, of the Atlantean and Lemurian races that were immense beings, huge men and women that were 12, 15 feet tall. And uh, there was a, a statement in Bailey's writings that some of her uh, followers were talking about. And she said that the, the, the mystery was, was that the pyramid was built from the top down. And so they envisioned the idea that it was first etheric, and that it, the top was built and then it solidified and then it came down to earth as this massive immense structure, which of course is a bunch of BS and malarkey and it's not what it was at all. What, what from top down means, this is initiate teachings that have been given to me by an initiate being, that that entire area of the Giza Plateau was, was surrounded with hills or even mountains of, of um, limestone. And they were able to cut the stones and simply slide them down into place, many of them. I don't know what the other apparatus was once they started to build up, but those, those hills of, of uh, stone were completely removed. There are 17 other hidden uh, uh, pyramids under the ground that they know about. They've done soundings and tests there and that they've, they've located 17 pyramids but haven't dug them up. They know that there are 230 some sunken cities off the coast of the Mediterranean, all along the coast of the Mediterranean. And uh, those have to be explored. We, we, many of us know and are aware that part of Alexandria Egypt is under, is in the ocean, that it was the sinking of the land. Baker said that in World War II, the British forces, which had been driven back by Rommel and the Nazis, the, had driven them to the Qatar Depression. And it was a safe haven. It was 600 miles across, I don't know how many miles deep, but they were able to regroup, they created what they call a retrograde movement where you, you retreat and they were found safety in the Qatar depression. But the, the Qatar depression is, a, is one of the most unusual uh, areas of land uh, on the planet in that it obviously at one time was above sea level and it sank and Baker speculated that it may also have been an outpost of Atlantis at one time, since it's west of the Giza Plateau and could very well have been part of the sunken Atlantis, which was destroyed uh, overnight, supposedly. But there are many stories about that. We've talked about a few of them uh, recently. I think I have a PowerPoint uh, on uh, a location that fits perfectly to Plato's uh, explanation of, uh, of Atlantis in Mauritania. Anyway, we're back to atavism. So these memories and things come with us. I had in my own childhood, these attractions to unusual things that opened the door for me to have an understanding of some of my past lives through meditation and through a coaxing by Dr. Baker and others that helped me uh, identify past lives as uh, American, as American Indians, as uh, living in a time of, of Robin Hood and uh, uh, Richard the Lionhearted and how archery was such an important part of my childhood. And of course, that was obviously an important part of the whole Robin Hood story, who is in, in incarnation. Uh, 
in, is back in England. Wasn't born there, but he's back in England. The real true Robin Hood, uh, who lived a series of mythical lives. And uh, a very interesting character. I may bring him here, uh, hopefully in the fall. But uh, he was of service to Richard Coeur de Leon and part of, I have a karmic connection to Coeur de Leon uh, through that lifetime and through one at the time of Shakespeare. And uh, an Ermanicaia who was active in the world and was in fact the true author of the Shakespearean plays wasn't Will Shakespeare. Will Shakespeare was illiterate, couldn't even spell his own name. And he sure as the world didn't write the plays and sonnets. The plays and sonnets are inspired and were written by uh, a, a human being of immense knowledge. But what Will did do was he aided the, the, this, the true author. There's a book on it right there, the true authorship of Shakespeare. Uh, and he was involved in the early development of the plays. And so that person is in the incarnation today in America, Will, Will Shakespeare. And he's helping once again, the Nermanakaya who authored the plays. Uh, I can't tell you any more than that, but um, it's it, food for thought. And uh, it's worth, uh, I believe, consideration. This whole idea of new mental illnesses was predicted by Rudolf Steiner, who said over a hundred years ago, a little over a hundred years ago, that the, the mass mental illness of America in the 21st century would be hysteria. Casual observation of the evening news and the events that have transpired just in the last few years, the very earliest part of the 21st century is evidence, uh, certainly for me, and I think any esoteric person who's willing to think about it, uh, that uh, <clears throat> hysteria is a part of life in America. And we're involved in it in many different ways, uh, through television, through video games, through uh, movies, through Hollywood, through game shows, uh, through uh, virtual realities, through politics and politicians, uh, hysteria. I, I remember when uh, Obama was running for president and uh, we talked a little bit about it tonight before we, we had our potluck dinner here. And uh, he sneezed, and the crowd just erupted in joyous applause and, and laughter. And I thought how really sad that is, but it shows the hysteria. It shows the degree of the hysteria that these people are caught up in. Some would try to say that uh, uh, they called it Obama mania. That's what I call it, too. I call it Obama. It has a counterpart. It's called Trump derangement syndrome. And invariably, the people who were taking part in Obama mania are the same group of people who are taking part in Trump derangement syndrome. It's the same ones. It's about half the country, uh, which is interesting too, because Gemini is the ascendant side for America, if you did the horoscope of America, the sign that fits best on the horoscope of America is Gemini. Gemini is two. It's like the Roman numeral two. We said that <clears throat> when the twin towers were taken down, that the moon had transited Gemini. At the very moment of those events, the moon was transiting Gemini the two towers. Uh, we're not surprised by that. If you're esoteric, you would expect that. Um, also, America 
has a second ray soul, number two, which it shares with England. So there's the Gemini aspect uh, in the, the two countries. But this whole thing of the hysteria, see it even comes through the news through an event like that causes people to be hysterical or COVID. See, we can all get hysterical about COVID. I had some young mother yelling at me in Kroger's right down the street here in the living room uh, that I was walking in the wrong direction in <laughs> aisle seven <laughs> and let me have it. <laughs> and you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. This is part of the, the the death of the Piscean age is we have to deal with this kind of insanity and these people uh, who are on the verge of hysteria themselves. And so it's worth consideration. But uh, <clears throat> I'm seeing it more and more. And we're looking at recent events. You know, we have to be able to take the esoteric and apply it to the relevant events of the day that we're living in. That's part of it. Having the ability to see the esoteric and how it's playing itself out. We're living at a, at a very strange and very unusual, very unique time in the world. It's the end of the century, the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. It's the end of the Piscean age and the birthing of the age of Aquarius. We've talked about it before. It's the, the end of the uh, second millennium and the beginning of the third, uh, which will be ruled by uh, Aquarius and Aquarius is ruled by Jupiter, which is the most benign of all of the astrological signs. And we expect it to be a beneficent age where the, the dearest hopes and wishes, 12th house, Pisces, uh, were never realized. The universal brotherhood of mankind was never realized, but it will be realized in the age of Aquarius. One of the unusual things that's happening in the world is that the population, we've talked about how the increased uh, population of the planet has affected reincarnation and how it's sped up. The wheel of rebirth is speeding up. And, uh, and so it's bringing many people, both young souls and old souls, souls and this mid-range of the kind of average uh, souls who are roughly halfway through their cycle through about a million year cycle but it's an odd time one of the most alarming things that i've come up with recently as far as the the uh, the problem The times that we're living in is the this whole idea of uh, having to uh, look back to the all-called writings and the teachings on Atlantis and the things that happened in Atlantis, atavism, it's a form of atavism, are happening again. And the proof is this. It was Mahatma Moya, who one of the authors and founders of the Theosophical Society, a very high initiate being, said that uh, 240,000 years ago, as the black magicians read the occult histories that Blavatsky and Leadbeater and others have talked about, that the black magicians of Atlantis had gained so much control and had distorted the great truths to such an extent that if you dare spoke the truth, you would be put to death. We're not far from that in the very day and age that we're living in right now. People don't want to hear the truth. 
And many of those people are the reincarnated same people that lived in Atlantis during that time. And so for them, it's perfectly natural, it's perfectly normal. But black magic is, as I told my vice president at General Motors, because that was the, the event in my life that objectified what is happening in the world right now in my life and in your life. The area of General Motors where I work, it was probably true of all of the areas, was very political and very corrupt. And they had high level people within the corporation that were sabotaging the designs to make the vice president look bad because the guy that wanted to be vice president and didn't get the job was very angry that he didn't get it. And so he was doing everything in his cronies to sabotage certain design jobs like the Aztec. Anybody remember the Aztec? Yeah. A nice car. They drive good. But, yeah, but they look ugly. <laughs> ugly looking, and it was and it was done on purpose. And mm -hmm. when the design was completed and was released, the the vice president, who was my friend, uh, said to the the certain group of executives, "You guys didn't do anything on that car that I asked for," and they didn't. They did everything they could to sabotage that design, and they got by with it because it was corrupt through and through, kind of like Washington, D.C., which is corrupt through and through. So we're witnessing things like that in the world. But the, this idea that I want to get across to you about these, these new mental illnesses and what's happening in the world other than the fact of a, a reincarnation or a reappearance of black magic in, in politics in the world, which is what it was in Atlantis 240,000 years ago, according to Mahatma Moria. I uh, don't have a picture. That's Kutumi over there, who was his associate in the founding of the Theosophical Society, Kutumi La Singh. Anyway, uh, so uh, what I want to get across is this this idea about these new, these new mental illnesses. And I first became aware of it, ironically, almost exactly 42 years ago. And 42 years ago, I was in Columbus, Ohio, and I met Douglas Baker for the first time. And he was talking about anorexia nervosa and bulimia and how they were new newly discovered mental illnesses that were afflicting uh, mostly young women. That's 42 years ago. And he said <clears throat> at that time, excuse me, he said there would be more new mental illnesses that would evolve in the world. And one of them that we've seen are these mass shootings by these young high school kids who have these semi audio semi-automatic rifles, not automatic rifles, semi-automatic, where you have to pull the trigger. On an automatic rifle, you just pull the trigger and it's a machine gun, it just keeps firing. But with a semi-automatic, you actually have to pull the trigger for each, each round to be uh, fired. It's not one thing, it's a series of things that are happening to these individual young men. Some of it is from their past life experiences in wars, endless wars of the 20th century uh, that have been World War I, World War II, Korea, on and on and on. Uh, the whole history of Europe is the history of war. And uh, so, uh, they're influenced by that. They're influenced by video games where you, it's all blow them up, shoot them, kill them. And it isn't real. It's not real. And so they, they, they make it real by doing it, by acting out. Acting out. We were talking about acting out. Uh, Lee, 
Padua and I were talking about somebody, a friend who's known to us who sometimes acts out. But uh, when I was a kid in high school, we used to bring our guns to school. And we would, in our class, we'd build a new stock maybe or fix the forearm, build a new forearm for the old pump, 22 gallery, 22 rifle. We blew the barrels or brown the barrels, depending on the age of the, you know, there was a flintlock rifle some kid had. Or, but we do that in art, in the art class. And nobody thought anything about it, you know? I can remember Kid Larry, what was his name? We used to call him Eddie Haskell. He looked just like Eddie Haskell. <laughs> and he's walking down the hallway with a brand new Mossberg shotgun, bringing it into our class because it had something wrong with the forearm and he was going to have the art teacher help him fix it. Nobody thought anything about it. <laughs> I will say I, I grew up in Indiana and uh, and they were a little different down there, but but that was the fact. Those are the facts. Nowadays, you would never do anything like that. My God, I mean, you'd be arrested at the door probably or something. Or I shot. Think. Or shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Your gun wasn't loaded. <laughs> that's right. So things have changed. And that's part of these, these new illnesses that are surfacing. It's not just Trump derangement. It's not just Obama mania, which are products of hysteria, but the hysteria can carry over into video games and the children become, become hysterical. Here's an example for you. We don't see it too much here in America. Once in a while, you'll see a little bit of uh, sporting events. If you go to a soccer game in England, you can be sure that there's going to be a terrible fight breakout. And the reason the fight breaks out is that the, the spectators, the enthusiasts who are there to root on their team, uh, they can't be on the soccer field playing. And so they have this aggression and this momentum is building within them. And oftentimes, it takes on the form of, of violence uh, in the soccer stadiums. It's throughout Europe. Of course, it's fueled by alcohol and other things too, but, but still it's there. And there's no denying it. Um, it's part of the, the reality of soccer throughout the world. It happens in many countries. But it's a form of, of a hysteria, it builds to a crescendo. Um, it's getting worse. It's getting worse because the Piscean age is dying and these energies are surfacing for their, their last dying breath. And you sometimes say people will, no, just before they die, they'll get better. I've seen it. I've been at hospitals and they will improve and then they die. And uh, I can remember going to see my uncle. And, uh, he had uh, rallied. And then that was it. It's gone. Can somebody check on the dogs? Cookie's make right sure here. Cookie is. Is laying that by the door? Is that Callie and, that's and barking? She's, or she's laying by her dog dish. Callie yeah. is. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. I just want to make sure there was everything was under control. We've got a, a three dogs here in the house tonight, and uh, can be sometimes. <laughs> Um, chaotic. So. It's eight ten. Is it eight ten? Okay. So yeah, we're having all of these these illnesses. Um, some of them aren't really illnesses, but they're products of past lives. We talked a little bit about it, where we talked about confused gender identity. If you lived thirty or forty lives in a female body, and because the wheel of rebirth is speeding up, and you haven't had a, a thousand years in between lifetimes to assimilate your experiences and you reincarnated uh, a month or a year after you died, the reincarnating permanent atom is energized and that memory is prevalent within it and you carry it with you. And how many times have we heard people say, uh, I'm a, a woman trapped in a man's body or I'm a, the opposite. 
trapped in a female body. It's worth considering. Now, I will open myself to some questions. If there's anybody on the Zoom who would like to uh, ask some questions, I'll humbly try to answer them. I don't guarantee that I can. And if there's anybody here in our group tonight, uh, I'll be glad to, uh, it's worth discussing. Mm -hmm. And we've got about what, 10 minutes left, Huli? We still have, I mean, are 50? you 18th, until 8.30, right? Is it 8.30? No, 8.05. So we have 25 minutes, right? Okay, well, we don't get any questions. I can keep talking, but is there anybody on Zoom that would uh, <clears throat> like to uh, uh, open the discussion here for uh, the consideration? David, what, David, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, what do you think that the vaccinations of all these the kids are getting has to do with their mental problems well the kids are scared stiff my buddy bill was my best buddy in vietnam He's got grandkids and he said his grandkids are they're afraid if they don't wear their mask they'll die oh that's I can't imagine being six years old seven years old and living with that kind of fear there's no yeah. telling what the long-term effects of that will be but it's it's something that we're going to have to try to be prepared for. But yeah, all of those things. We don't know the long-term effect of uh, the, the COVID vaccinations, and we don't know the long-term effect of kids playing video games. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be some great good come out of it, but there may also be great bad come out of it also. But the vaccinations that the children, the babies are getting, the vaccinations? Yeah, when before they're even a year old, they're like oh, yeah, it's, 37 it's, of them. Yeah, it's all part of the hysteria, see? We're gonna scare the hell out of everybody, so we'll get them all vaccinated. It's absurd. I, I was I I never got a vaccination. Uh, but I know that the heart attacks are up something like 40 or 50 percent among people who've been vaccinated. Um, and they, it's also true in the military where they were forced to be vaccinated and the, the heart attacks are through the, through the roof, 50% or higher. They're poison. They increase, what? They're poison. Yeah, yeah. Now my sister who actually was healed from cancer, let the doctors talk and they did a PET scan and found no cancer. And they, they talked her into recommended that she still take the chemo and the radiation. So she took a, a few, two weeks of, of radiation and chemo and she developed uh, radiation poisoning. She also uh, has suffered from, which they didn't tell her to her face, but they wrote it out on the, the printout, uh, septicemia caused by the radiation. So that's modern medicine and people are starting to wake up. It's a slow, arduous process, but they're waking up to the reality of uh, the fallacies of many of the fallacies of modern medicine. And of course, I don't have to tell this group here, uh, many of us are involved with the Energy Medicine Research Institute and are concerned with alternative healing and esoteric healing. So yeah, it's a dangerous thing. And uh, I don't recommend it. Yeah, Bob. Uh, my personal opinion about new psychotherapy, uh, use of psychedelic, organic psychedelic drugs, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. marijuana, CBD, things yeah. like this. Yeah. Is there any relation to that with the activism or is there any positive Aspect or healthy aspect, actually used to use uh, treatments. Yeah, yeah, there can be positive things, but the overuse of those <clears throat> is not positive. Uh, and the reason it's not positive, I tried to explain this to a guy on the, the Facebook who publishes stuff constantly. He never has anything new 
See, he's new in the field. And so he's rehashing all these old uh, guys from the past, initiate teachers and, and alchemists. And, and uh, so he's uh, very upset with me because I don't recommend hallucinogenic drugs. They have their place minimally. The problem is, is that when you take those drugs, it burns. We had a chart here, we don't. It burns the filaments between the nadis, and the nadis lie between the chakras, our nadis. They're like little tiny reservoirs, sort of like chakras, and they are connected by an etheric filament. And when you take those powerful hallucinogenic drugs, it burns the filaments between the nadi and the chakra. And it may take three or four lifetimes, incarnations, to reconstruct those in the etheric body. And that's why it's dangerous. They used to say years ago that people didn't even know what they were talking about. It's like it just came out of the air. And they would talk about uh, guys, Vietnam guys. I can remember being in a, a friend's uh, house and uh, a lady. She, there was this guy walked by the street. It was down in the West Central neighborhood in Fort Wayne, down by the rivers. It was a beautiful area, just gorgeous area. And this guy was kind of a scary looking guy. And uh, he'd be walking through the neighborhood. And she said, oh yeah, that's, that's one of those Vietnam guys that's burnt out on acid, or, you know, whatever other drugs he was, he was using. And, and they didn't know what burnout meant. But burnout, they're talking about the, the etheric filaments between the nadis and the chakras. That's what they're talking about. He's burnt out. I was in the army with guys that were burnt out and you'd look into their eyes and they were just like holes. You know, there was nothing there. Brian Titus and Jim Finnegan used to, this is after we got back from Vietnam. You couldn't, you couldn't do that in the, if you were in the infantry. You wouldn't even be able to get drugs. But uh, they would, uh, I remember, put uh, acid in the first sergeant's coffee one morning. And, uh, I think Christina has a question. Christina? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Christina. Are you there? Christina? Can they hear us? I no. think so. I don't have a question. OK. Uh, our mistake. Okay, Don's got Don Holiday's got a question. Yeah, I, I wondered uh, about uh, just to switch the topic a little bit. Is uh, is it is uh, being a uh, um, okay avatarism or whatever that is? Is that uh, atavism? Atavism. 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 That's, okay, new terminologies. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but is that along the line of initiates or, okay, is... Uh, no. So the, no, it's not. They, everybody's affected by it at some point in the life cycle of the soul. They, all the initiates. Okay, so it's like had, a book that you learn from. It's, well, atavism is the, you're carrying with you in your reincarnating permanent atom the memories of past lives. Right, but you're experiencing them again. Yeah, you're experiencing them and living through them and uh, fascinations with things that are inexplicable is a characteristic of, of, of an atavistic tendency. Hmm. Like cell memory. Yeah, no, cell, okay. cell memory. Okay, yeah. so this Similar. part of your intuition. Similar. What is inexplicable? Can't explain it. It's oh. impossible to explain. Inexplicable. Explicable. Mm. I got another question. Yeah. Uh, Jesus was a man mm -hmm. and then he became Christ. Mm -hmm. How'd that work out? I mean, how did that? <laughs> how was, <laughs> was, uh, well, book, according to the book, it didn't turn out very well. So, but, but uh, what was the anointment? 
Uh, can you explain that transition between man to Christ? Yeah, yeah. Because I know a, a little bit, I'm aware of it, but I need to yeah. get more clarification. Yeah. If you read the story of the New Testament, okay. Big difference between the New Testament and the Bible. And in the New Testament, they delineate five important events in the life of Jesus. The birth. The baptism. The transfiguration. The crucifixion. And the resurrection. Those are five initiations symbolically. And that when those initiations, those five initiations are completed successfully, a human being moves in to the kingdom of souls. He becomes a uh, uh, as different uh, a human uh, as you and I are from cats and dogs. They become, they're, they're living as souls. Mm -hmm. They have what uh, uh, Roberto Assagioli called, uh, uh, what do you call it, Tracy? Called Psychosynthesis. It. Psychosynthesis. You're living as a soul in the world. Uh, if you're doing things that are soul destroying, are you doing bad things? You're not, you're not living as a soul. And uh, so it behooves all of us to try to live as a soul. Uh, it's best explained and understood by, by this uh, analogy or this statement that I'm about to make. What you should be doing in, in each incarnation is you should be working toward helping the solar logos, the being who ensouls our solar system. Think of that as, as God. And that you have to help in some way. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to help by teaching things that are inexplicable in exoteric terminologies and terms. We're using the esoteric to explain uh, abstruse ideas. Uh, we talk about mental illnesses of the future. Uh, here's one for you. Uh, the cable television men are being trained in a new mental illness when they're called to people's homes. And the mental illness is called targeted individual syndrome. And it's where the, in 99% of the cases, it's a divorced woman, usually middle-aged, who calls the cable company to tell them that her ex-husband is spying on her through the television. And it's an epidemic and nobody's talking about it but me. And so they call the cable company. <laughs> and they say, you got to get out here. I went through it because I, I had a lady friend that lived here for three years. I can't believe I ever allowed myself misfortune to be tortured <laughs> on a daily basis by this, this woman. But anyway, it's all water over the dam. <laughs> I'm beginning to pull myself in together. Learning experience. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> getting took, took 30 years <laughs> off my life. <laughs> but uh, so anyway. I mean, I mean, why you say that 30 years? Was she that good? I mean, she was that crazy? She was crazy. Yeah, she, she was, was manic. Crazy. Her horoscope showed it. I was actually trying to help her. This was a, a, a non sexual relationship. The woman lived here, and, you know. And, and I tried to help her. Yeah. So, but so I mean, so why would you? Why? I, so you just suck into the her the craziness, like the, like a disease, or why? 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 What? I mean, if she was that crazy, mm -hmm. did you like suck? She no, no. She was very good at her mental illness. She could function and go to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. 
and she could go shopping mm -hmm. and she could be entertained and be entertaining. And she loved her children and she lived a normal life, but she so that's good. periodically, periodically during the course of a day, she would go off on some tangent about her ex-husband and, and just say the most bizarre thing. Like, like what? Well, we got to go over there and kill him. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> she, she would work herself into a frenzy, see? And then I would have to calm her down and uh, explain things to her, which is difficult to do because when you're irrational and illogical and you're trying to use logic and rationale to explain things, they're divergent paths. Yeah, but a lot of, I think, exes and people get divorced. I think every, you know, I've seen a lot. They hate each other. They want to kill each other, but that yeah. doesn't make that them crazy, right? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, it's well, insanity. You know, what it is, we've accepted. Part of the collective unconscious mm -hmm. is what it is. Yeah. And there's so many divorced people out there. And there's so oh, many yeah. that it's flooding that collective unconscious mm -hmm. and unconsciously mm -hmm. these people you know, we're all connected, so mm -hmm. they they're more sensitive to that emotion, maybe, or that mm -hmm. yeah. Know, well, it's that just feel. it's just unresolved trauma, basically. I think, but if you think your husband is spying on ex you, ex-husband, ex-husband, yeah, that's fixing into the area of I'm delusional right. and paranoid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. that's she so suffered much. all the, all of that. She she didn't have one mental illness, one illness. No. She oh, had yeah. multiple. She, she was manic. She had a horoscope that showed that she was a gold digger. Oh she my was, God. Uh, she was a groupie for sports stars and rock stars and followed Bruce Springsteen and was enamored with Bruce Springsteen until she met him and he was only five feet four inches tall and she's almost six feet tall. And so that. <laughs> The reality therapy. <laughs> that sounds like about 15 year old. Right yeah, now. yeah. It's frozen, frozen, yeah. pediomorphically frozen in a mentality that she's maintained since she was 15 years old. We're yeah. probably worth people, some trauma here. People do that. We call them adult delinquents. You know, <laughs> the pool rooms in America used to be, when they used to have pool rooms, they were full of guys like that cornbread red and Minnesota fats. Or, all those guys and they were 70 and 80 years old and still acted like they were 15. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so there you meet people like that in your life. We had them at General Motors. I mean, you would expect that. So yeah, but uh, uh, what I'm telling you about this targeted individual syndrome is a real thing. And it's so real that the cable company, the Comcast guy, I remember talking to him in the parking lot down at the Kroger store on Livermore. He had just been to my house. And, I walked up to him and I said, uh, excuse me, uh, <laughs> could I ask you a question? <laughs> the guy's eating lunch in the parking lot on the west side of the parking lot at Kroger's. He said, yeah, yeah. Hey, I was just at your house. Yeah. Uh, you know that crazy lady that's living there? Yeah. He said, uh, do you run into that often? And that's when he told me that they're trained when they go into these, they had these women that call them every other day, come out and fix my TV. And, uh, and they'll do it for about three or four days and then they start charging. See? And then it gets into big money. So, and uh, and, it, and they're trained into what is called individual, what I call it? The targeted individual syndrome. They know about it. It's a mental illness and, and it's brand new. And they're coming through your cable TV, the ex-husband, see? Okay, so, so maybe new technology. Maybe they see something. Well, exactly. The new technologies are going to bring all kinds of, of new mental illnesses. And we never had high school kids going in and shooting babies and little children in school. Nobody ever did that. I told you, when I was a kid, we used to take our guns to school. <laughs> I'm not talking about Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, back when I was in high school, back you know, back in that little last ice age, the uh, <laughs> school. Yeah, we had to take a hundred safety course. I think it was about eight. Yeah, they used to have 
and the teacher absolutely. brought in a couple of guns yeah. to demonstrate. Absolutely. Nobody, again, nobody absolutely. We had all that stuff. We even had, we had an archery class in our school. They had uh, uh, different things like the hunting. You know, they give to teach kids how to hunt. You know, different stuff. Agriculture, 4-H and FFA and, and all that stuff. You know, and they used to have what they called pest hunts. And the pest hunt, everybody got their guns and went out at night and shot rats and, and animals that were pests. And you got so many points. See, for each each mouse you shot. Yeah. See, <laughs> and they call them guns. They call pests. So, quick, quick question. It's true. I'm not making that up. So it's funny. David. It's true. So there's a question from Audrey. Audrey. How, how long? Did Hi, Audrey. She, how Hi, long Audrey. did she live with you until you figure out she was crazy? <laughs> uh, two days. <laughs> two days, and I knew she was absolutely out of her mind. And that was when I did her horoscope. And everything it even showed uh, in, in her horoscope it showed the whole thing. That's the beauty of this yeah, astrology. Yeah, but let's say if you didn't look at her horoscope, could you, did you, I mean, did you, could you figure that out? Well, what happened? Let me tell you what happened, because mental illness is a degenerative thing. She got worse. That off. She got worse and worse and worse until it became unbearable. And so I drove down to the 52nd District Court and I got an eviction notice. No, 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 no. Turn that off, please. It's an individual targeted person. Yeah. On the phone. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> what are you <laughs> Anything else? Audrey? Is, uh, is there a relation between mental illness and the shootings we are hearing about? Oh yeah, definitely. Sure. You missed it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that, another part of that too is this. Let me explain this to you. You know, we said that there were young souls that were coming in in vast numbers. They're coming in because it's a last chance for the in the earth chain and the earth chain life cycle. And these souls that don't make the grade will, it will reincarnate in other solar systems and planets similar to Earth, and they'll carry out their evolution of their soul uh, in those other solar systems. They're not completely bound to the solar system. I don't need a law to tell me that I shouldn't kill somebody, but young souls do because they don't know that they shouldn't kill somebody. Killing is a very normal thing. You, yeah. You'd see guys in the army that were just bloodthirsty murderers, and and the, might be next to a guy who was a saint, and they're all in Vietnam together. And that's what the earth is. Mm -hmm. It's all these people of these different stages of evolution. This whole idea that that we're all equal is baloney. We're not all equal. We're not all equal as far as the age of the soul is concerned, because some souls are young, some are average, and some are very old souls. So I wanted to ask you something like, I mean, yeah. it's just so weird. Like, I mean, it's not, maybe it doesn't relate to it, but I just was thinking about how everybody's so crazy. Mm -hmm. So I have like two, um, different orders from the court mm -hmm. they wanted to they sent me a home and wanted to uh you know like know how much this house was will sell to separate homes mm -hmm. and and i give them the estimate and the attorneys are saying yes this needs to be sold because the people the owner the household owners mm -hmm. they buy tons of stuff and then they decided they didn't want to pay back and those people are start suing it. And then I think they file a bankruptcy, but there is an equity in the house. So they want to sell the house and pay off the creditors. Mm -hmm. So they hire me and say, okay, let's put the houses on the market. Mm -hmm. So there's two separate homes. And the one of them, I put it on the market. 
she's not allowed anyone to see the house. So, and I told the uh, attorney there, hey, you know, there's all these people wanted to see the house, but no, she's not allowing. Mm -hmm. So she went, she filed a motion with the court. And then she says, and then the court says, okay, you have to allow the showings and, and they decided not every all day, but she can allow the showing between three until six. Mm -hmm. So I have offer cash offer above asking price. And then she, we need to do the inspection mm -hmm. and she's not allowing that. Mm -hmm. And she, and that lady files a motion that saying, I list the house over market value. Mm -hmm. So, and then the judge say she wanted to see me in the court. Mm -hmm. So I went as a witness and explaining so that we're saying, so do you think this house is overpriced? I say, well, I do have a cash offer over asking price, mm -hmm. what it tells you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and the, how the owner saying, well, no, it's still overpriced. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. I say, yeah, but I have an official offer, mm -hmm. legal document, not mm -hmm. just verbal, mm -hmm. everything. This person's ready to buy and everything else supports this value. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just need to make sure that is, you know, like we allow him to do the inspection because everybody wants to do the inspection. So uh, she, uh, she said, well, um, judge asks her, why do you think your house is overpriced? She says, well, because there was a one house, it sold like so much lower than what I told, mm -hmm. whatever. And then, and then judge is questioning me. So what do you think about that? I say, well, I don't know which house she's referring to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, and then she says, well, there was a house. And I say, which one? Mm -hmm. I, and I and I say, well, I don't have my computer, but I can definitely look it up. And it's, but I don't know everything what it's sold. I only know what I know. Mm -hmm. And then, so they allow me to access to the internet and look at that house. It was burned out house, mm -hmm. and it sold so much cheaper. And I still have to, like, the house never sold. So. You know, like, so she says, okay, you know, like, so I've been explaining and explaining. So at the end, I had to take the house off the market because she, mm -hmm. she never allowed six months, not one time showing, no inspection, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And the court still doesn't grant access, direct access to, you know, like to the property. Yeah. So right. like that, like now the problem is the, the law, like when you say, hey, there's a laws and there's a regulation. It just doesn't matter. So it's like they pretty much taking this woman's side, even though she charged everybody. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's not good. I mean, every, everybody is not rich. Everybody, you know, where she buys stuff is a small business owner like me, probably, I'm assuming. And she they refused to pay everybody. It's 8.33. I don't know if you need to know that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now, are you asking a question? Okay, the, my question is, what do you think about that? Is this kind of like related? Is the judges also like mentally retarded? They cannot see what is right, what is wrong? I mean, I just don't get it. <laughs> and it's the end of the Piscean Age, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult period in the fourth ray energy, as we've talked about before is coming in very powerfully. And one of the things that we probably, all of us will begin to see will be decentralized government where the power will be taken out of Washington DC and given back to the states. And that has always been the issue with, um, with when the country was founded, states rights versus federal rights. And the reason that Washington DC is so corrupt is because the majority of the power is centered there. It's a terrible place and it has to change and it will change through states taking a greater you know, responsibility for government.
governing themselves. It's fourth ray. So the fourth ray is everywhere. It's in it's in your situation with in the real estate business. People are in uh, discord and chaos. Fourth ray is chaos. But that's terrible. So I have similar situation with another property. So she's allowing she she doesn't want to let anybody seen is only one hour it's like 10 o'clock in the morning everybody works people that who can buy a home there's a lot of mentally sick people out there the and the, court, the judge is saying oh that's okay if somebody wants to see it they can come and see it and i'm thinking yeah but that doesn't work like that yeah. and then she, and then she tells everybody so a couple of people come in and she wouldn't allow them to see it and she says yeah there's a dangerous mold it's very, very harmful. Stuffy watchers. You're going to die if you Watch go me. in. Yeah. And then I told this to the attorney. Attorney says to the judge, she says, well, if it's dangerous, I wanted to know that too. And at the meantime, those people live there and they're still living there. Nobody's dying yet. So it's not, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. things like that. And I'm trying to explain them. They're sabotaging the sale. And, and then she's asking the question, she's questioning me, well, do, do you think is, is it very harmful? And I'm thinking- yeah, she condemn the house. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I mean. If it was well, that bad, you know, like they couldn't be, I mean, they wanted to, that's why they, how come they are not out if it's that bad, you know? Okay, well, listen, uh, I'll get back with you. Okay. Uh, did you have a question, Terry? I saw yeah, you I, raised your I don't hand. know if we can go over the, the Zoom thing because I can ask it. It's now. okay. Yeah, the, um, I think the I, Zoom will I had shut off automatically. Oh, okay. No, it's, there? it's, no, they're still there. Yeah. They, okay. Yeah. I had a, a good friend who uh, made the transition about 15 years ago. I don't uh -huh. like to say past. Right. Or right. Died is okay, but I like to make the transition. Right. And he used to tell me <clears> that <throat> in his past life, he lived on another planet. And he wasn't full. I mean, he was like really down to earth and, mm -hmm. you know, mentally stable and everything. And mm -hmm. I, I, I've always considered, I haven't learned that much about it, but I've always considered that, you know, we're, we're not the only gig in town. I, I, I'm sure of that, but I, I always wondered, okay, so, and he'd tell me like stories about the things he did there and everything. Mm -hmm. and I guess it was kind of similar to this or whatever, but I just wonder like, so where us all on the earth here, um, how does the earth seem to rate, like, when I die, if I choose to come back to the earth, or I might choose to go somewhere else, mm -hmm. like, is it, uh, is the earth considered, like, a really good place to be able to go, or are there other mm -hmm. places that yeah, are other, as other. good or better, yeah. and then we, we basically go where our energy is most compatible, I'm, I think, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But I always kind of wondered how the Earth kind of rates in, in you know, the, the belief system. Like if there's other... It's an average planet, an average solar system. It's what the Earth is. It's a beautiful place. Um, life has existed throughout the universe. <laughs> We're not the first and we won't be the last. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, It has a, a purpose. It has a life. It's evolving, just like you and I are evolving, mm -hmm. just like the solar system is evolving. Our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is evolving. See, yeah. it goes goes on ad infinitum. The whole thing is evolving. Uh, many years ago, uh, when I was a young guy, maybe in my mid twenties. I had an experience where I was taken back to the beginning of the universe to the time of the Big Bang experience. And I was it was explained to me by an immense being, probably a Buddha or a Christ-like being, what I call a Nanakaya. And I became aware through his explanation to me that the, the experience of the Big Bang was an, an initiatory experience, initiatory experience, that even our solar system is evolving 
and our planet, our, our universe is evolving to a higher level. And so the, the third postulate of the eight of the seven postulates of the ageless wisdom teaching is as above, so below. And so whatever the rules are in the microcosm, they apply in the macrocosm. Whatever the rules are in the macrocosm, they apply in the microcosm. If you study Anthropogenesis, which is largely is volume two of the secret doctrine, uh, Blavatsky explains this, uh, this whole process. Uh, I was really fortunate because out of her seven or 800 page explanation, um, I was able, I was told by an immense being what the real essence of it was in the very beginning. And it made the whole study of cosmogenesis and anthropogenesis really easy for me. And that's why I, I like to share that story because it makes it easier for each of you to understand it. That Blavatsky said, if you want to worship God, you should worship space. Space, see? That's what it's all about. So there could have been more than one big bang. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. How many universes are there? On a planet that was yeah. that particular big bang. Yeah, Teswar, who was Yogananda's master, who's his teacher, <laughs> said there were, I think he said there were 96 universes that he was aware of. 96 <laughs> universes. See? They're probably infinite. Yeah, exactly. I would think it was Just like what, they used to say there were two galaxies. Yeah. Now there's a billions. As the, as the technology improves and they get these satellite telescopes up there, they're blowing their minds, you know? It's endless. Yeah, I told the guys, they brought a bunch of scientists in from the University of Michigan to General Motors Design Center to give a lecture on the, the latest findings of the Hubble telescope. And, uh, and so I went up afterwards, you know, you could go up and talk to these guys. And I had a couple of them cornered over there. And I was telling them about the, how important I felt it was that they should read The Secret Doctrine by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. And it would explain this whole idea of the birth of the universe to them so that they would be able to make sense out of the Hubble telescope photographs they were receiving. And of course, they didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's it for tonight. Yeah, you can say goodbye to everybody. Yeah. Okay, folks, thanks for the Zoom meeting, uh, coming to the meeting. And uh, I don't know when our next one will be because I'm leaving for Indiana tomorrow to help my sister. It'll, uh, but I'll put it on Facebook. I don't know what the title will be, uh, but uh, we'll make sure it's something interesting. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thanks. Yeah. So I 